So you do, Bad is welcome to Bad Boy Running. And we, we've mentioned actually about our next guest about six months ago when we went out to Germany to see the launch of the On Running team and um, the non-launch of their shoe yet because they hadn't got it ready. So um, at the time, we thought we'd let George, um, George is our favourite. We're, we're putting our cards on the table. He's our favourite from the group. <laughs> They've not met everyone yet. That's why. <laughs> we're still on the other zone. If they want to come in the future. Uh, exactly, exactly. And um, But also we thought it'd be really good to, because because it seemed as if they'd, they'd only really brought this team together relatively recently, we thought it'd be good to wait a few months to, to really get, to let George get a sense of what it's going to be like. So welcome on the podcast, the wonderful George Mills. Whee! Pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me on. So, so since good, we last met... you guys again. Yeah, oh, thanks, George. So, I mean, this is why we liked you so much. Actually, before we start, were you kidnapped from another country as a child? And you're going to reveal this in ten years' time, out of interest, just for just for context for athletes from GB. Probably not. No. Good. Good. Okay. It's an aggressive start. It's an aggressive start. <laughs> How is an aggressive, so, um, oh, aggressive topical <laughs> start there? <laughs> so, um, since we've last seen you, then, like, how how many places have you been jumping around to? Man, so um, when did we see? So it, we saw you in Zurich at the start of May. Yeah, think, which, is Ger- yes. which is Germany according to uh, Hellard's geography, but never mind. Yeah, <laughs> it's close. <laughs> the Swiss wouldn't be too happy about that, but I think the Germans would probably say. Oops. Yeah. Oops. Um, so yeah, I've been. We spent quite a bit of time in Leipzig training there, and then yeah, and then I've. I've dotted around Europe racing. I went back to the UK for a bit. Um, and then, where did I go? Went to went to France a couple of times for a few races. Been racing in Switzerland. So yeah, lots of lots of flights. And now in San Moritz, been here for about a month. This is our like summer base, you may call it. So all of the team are here in, in an apartment living together, which is pretty cool. So yeah, I love, been, I love been the traveling idea. a lot, but but nice to, nice to be staying in one place for a bit it, now. It's that kind of big brother, real world experience, but in real life, without the cameras, hopefully, in the same way. So how did, take us back then to, because um, we'd, we'd really love to get a sense of almost the last five years from <laughs> from the point at which you knew you were a good runner to how how you've kind of come through the system and 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 really getting an understanding of, along the way, what your choices were, which ones were you forced to make, which ones did you maybe take that, and, and because I'm fascinated to really understand, you know, how do British athletes progress? Yeah. So, um, uh, obviously running kind of got properly into it when I was around, maybe say 14, 15. Got really into it with my school, joined the local club, like we're just doing cross countries, local meet, these sorts of things. What was the local club? And like Harrogate Harriers. Oh, nice. Okay, so, like yeah, I was from up, up north originally. Yeah, so that was that was my club, and then um, yeah, and then kind of had a really really good coach there, and she brought me through from probably fifteen to eighteen, picked up. In English schools title like took me to various English schools and then uh, one European youths back in 2016 over the 800 meters so yeah a long time ago but that was the that was a start and then and, and just going back that, to I, that just going back to that so when you do you have to qualify for England youth because I don't think we've even talked about that or um, is it is oh, it a European, regional yeah. So, yeah so that was kind of um so for European the Europe, it was I. You do you know the English school system and hmm. and things like this where you qualify for your area, then you race off to qualify for your county, and then yeah, if you're fortunate enough, I'd say you get you get picked for your county. And that that my first experience with that was when I was fifteen. I went to a cross country, and then obviously the the track meets came came further down the line, and then after you progress through. Through that, obviously, they have trials once you get a little bit older. So I was 17, and I competed in the European under-18 British team trials. And 
was again lucky enough to make the team and have success in that event. So it was, it's very much like a a steady a steady progression through. I'd say where you go from like area count competition, county mm. competitions, maybe northern, then national, and then if you're lucky enough, you can try to make the step into international in the age group level. And at that stage, say when you, you, you it's obvious you're kind of an international level. Are you? Is it still all of your training, all of your coaching is just done locally in Harrogate, or does that start to become kind of a UK athletics team GB manager who starts um, to kind of send you the odd text or starts to get involved? No, so in- it was all it was all very much um, all the coaching was just from my local local coach at Harrogate. But there was obviously British Athletics have programs um, such as I think it's the they have a program called ACE, which is for like fifteen to seventeen year olds, which is like a almost like a college course sort of thing, just to educate athletes on nutrit like the basics of nutrition, recovery, training sort of thing. And then also they have obviously in the the funding system they have like the futures level, which is for the for the younger kids who they think could progress on to make senior teams one day. So that came a little bit later on. And yeah, never they never really pushed to change coaches or anything like this. They offered support and offered knowledge, but yeah, the coach in that period stayed stayed the same. And and when it comes to because you know, eighteen when you're it sounds like that was the stage at which you were kind of going into that more international. Mm-hmm. That's also where you've got the choice about universities and and yeah. which ones to go to and and you know there are some one or two very good sports universities um, you know and then other universities that may be very good academically that aren't like do how was much of your decision of what to do for the next three that kind of three year period was was related so, to sports so pretty much most most of the decisions to be honest. But that that time actually, I think it got a little bit interesting to me. So I, I came off that high of being European under eighteen champion, which at that time is like probably one of the best, like the, one of the best feelings in the world. Obviously, I look back now and I'm like, okay, yeah, kids competition doesn't mean anything now. But at that time, you it's a bit of a whirlwind. But yeah, yeah after coming off that, it got got a bit interesting. I actually missed two years of racing through injury i got oh. picked up two stress fractures and a big hamstring there oh but god in in, in this time yeah uh, within within 12 months and what do you so think that, could, what caused that so i think a lot of so the first the first one happened when i was still up in harrogate i was um still um finishing school and stuff like and that and i think that was just probably Maybe being a bit excited coming off a successful year before, maybe increasing training intensity a little bit. Not it wasn't a drastic change, but a little bit too much. Hmm. And then obviously like little things like maybe recovery wasn't bang on, maybe sleep wasn't right if I was having to get up early to go to school, do more training. And yeah, I think I think those sorts of things happen quite often to to young athletes just out of eagerness. You're still developing. You want to do more. Mm. If you're that, if you're that type of personality, like you're always, I was always the guy. Still am. Who wants to push? Wants to do as much as mm. I can. So it's kind of like learning the balance. And I wouldn't change it at all now because I think it's shaped me into the athlete and person that I am today. But at the time, it was a it was a tough experience. But actually, at that at that time as well, when I turned eighteen, finished school, I decided to change and join. Tom Dick, which, um, a coach who's based down in Brighton. So I actually went, decided to go to university down there as well, study sports science. And at that time, he had a really, had a really strong group at that time as well. So it was a good opportunity for me to go and learn off older athletes such as Charlie Grice, Carl Langford, Elliot Giles, and take as much from them as I can of, as an 18-year-old. And, and we, we were interviewing... Um... Just last week, actually, a, a a javelin thrower from the from the eighties until well, until like t- twenty twelve, he was still 
at the age of what, 53, second in the UK trials, he was saying at that stage, it was really obvious that there were kind of two universities you chose from. One of them um, is, is now called South Bank University and the other one was Loughborough. Like when, when you're 18 and you, you look at your options, like, is it very obvious which universities are the ones for like 1500 meter runners? Like, is, are, are there quite a few choices or um, are there some clear? I'd say, I'd say no. To be honest, I'd say obviously you've got you've got Loughborough where every quite a lot of like high achieving sports people go and and various and which is completely understandable. I wouldn't say there's like one place where you're like, okay, if I want to be a successful middle distance runner, long distance runner, I need to go here. Hmm. I think it's very much like different places work for different people and it's about finding where you feel comfortable, the environment that you want to work in and the people that you want to surround yourself with as well. And so are you going there kind of looking at sports facilities, finding out who the, the coaches are, seeing who the other yeah. athletes are? Yeah, so I think um, I think it's more of, I never, I never considered luck for too much, to be honest, in places like this. I was, for me, I was either going to stay up in Harrogate, go to Leeds University and stay with the coach who has brought me through or move to go to Brighton and join join the group down there and go to university down there as well. So for me, it was more about the opportunities that I could get within the sport. And then I kind of picked my university to go to go with that. And um, And what is university life like when you're trying to train at that high level because we yeah, have I'll, I'll be honest i you like you could ask my mates at uni i did probably none of it to be honest i don't think i joined them on a on a night out or anything like this which is probably a bit <laughs> some people might say it's sad but at that time i i wanted to i just i've been injured for a long time i've just joined a new training group with loads of uh, olympians like guys who were competing at world championships and various things like this and I wanted to show that I could fit in there and, and join in the training and like impress the coach and, and everything like this so at, at that point I was I had complete tunnel vision on trying to do everything I could to, to get fit again to impress the new coach to perform at the best level I could what was so that was, yeah I was obviously doing I'll say what was that what, Sorry? I mean there must have been like a huge amount of like peer pressure on you um, you know, especially somewhere mm. like Brighton, it's not exactly kind of like you know, it, it's just <laughs> it, the whole the whole environment is 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 kind of geared towards you know student life as to however that wants to receive it. Like oh, how? Yeah, very, very much. Yeah. So how? Like how? Like did, what? What kind of did you have to do? Did it get easy to deal with it? Did you have to like deal with all like this pressure for like a year and then everyone was... kind of realised? Or how how did how did that kind of play out? Because I I'm sure that this is a, a situation that. Mm. loads of mm. loads of potential athletes come unstuck as soon as they get into an environment where they you know there is peer pressure there are so many other distractions that's like where they, they really get tested as it were yes yeah, so I, I actually i was probably a little bit used to it already because of uh like when you're coming towards the end of school and stuff people are starting people are turning 18 where they're starting to go out a bit more yeah. and they were always like oh come 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 i was like i was i'm quite comfortable saying no yeah, to a lot of things. If I don't want to do something, I don't think it's right for me. So that doesn't. It never really bothered me what what people thought because I I was so focused on wanting to get to a certain level and achieve everything that I could. And in my head, I was like, oh, okay. If I if I do stuff like this, I'll if I don't achieve it, I'll just be like, okay, what was I what was I doing? Like you've got you haven't done everything you can. Yeah. So it wasn't it wasn't really a problem for me. I was I was quite happy to be like, yeah, no, I'm not I'm not doing this. I've got got to be up for training at seven in the morning or whatever. And yeah, I was I was actually lucky at university. Everybody was well. My, the guys that are still my mates now are completely understood. They never like were pestering me to do it. And if I ever did join them for something like later on or or now, they were like, oh, mate. It's, if that's you, for example, like it's very, very easy. 
Do you, do you think it affected your friendships there? Because in some, what well, you know, when you sometimes everyone's gone and done something, or everyone's watched something, or everyone, and they have almost this lingo about the the stories that they they know that they've mm. shared. And did you find that it, you, it isolated you from certain groups of people? Um, potentially, but I'd I'd never I'd never looked at it like that. I'd say maybe I did miss out on certain things that happened but we always did other stuff as well as like during the daytime or yeah. we'd hang out on evenings and such but yeah I've, I've never i've always been very comfortable with my own company and like felt quite self-assured i'm not worried about what other people think and hmm. worrying about oh i miss out on this miss out on that everyone in this um in the, everyone in the training group at the moment thinks i'm a bit I'm a bit weird because I'm always like, oh, yeah, I don't don't care. Where I have to go like wherever the coach tells me to go, I'll go. I'm not bothered about going home. I'll go home and see everyone in the off season and and these sorts of things. So yeah, I feel like I'm just yeah fairly easy going in that sense and like comfortable with my with myself and doing what I feel I need to do. And, so and the, flip, did coming the into... flip side, the flip side is they they all think you're weird for doing that. So does that mean that? The, the rest of the team are resistant to to to, to like not, suggestions like that. What, it, like just it, it just want to understand. The no, context. I think I think everybody's I think everybody's different, isn't it? I think like I don't have a problem. I could be like not see my friends or family for for twelve months, and I'd be like, okay, yeah, I have to do this yeah. because this is what we have to do to get to where we want to be. Whereas other people, it's like like what I was saying is about finding the balance that works best for you. Like some people may need to go and see girlfriends, family, friends every four, six weeks after a long training camp away, which is completely normal and understandable. And it's probably more normal than, than my sort of mindset. So I think everybody, it's just, it's just a bit, little bit of a joke within the team that is like, yeah, you don't, you don't care what's going on. Like you'll just do whatever. <laughs> and do you think that's part of the age as well? Cause you, you, you are slightly older than some of the team. Yeah, potentially, but I'm, I think you obviously only, you guys met Noah, Fabi and Marta. Um, Noah and Fabi, 19 and 20, and Marta was 24. Marta hasn't completely joined up with us yet because she was finishing studying as a, to become a doctor. So she joins up with us properly. She'll come out here in, uh, next, in the next three weeks. So she'll pop in and then... We have Tom, the Swiss guy, who's 25, Robert, the German guy, he's 24 at the moment. So everyone, there's a, there's a good mix of age, but I think it's, it's like, depends on your life situation as well. I think a lot of, I think all of the team have girlfriends, boyfriends, so they've got that, that part of their, well, apart from mm -hmm. me, everyone's got that part of their life that they want to keep going and enjoy and they want mm -hmm. to sustain. So it's, it's about, it's about finding the balance for you and what, what works best and then um, and kind of getting back to university you're talking about kind of these goals and and being so focused on trying to improve and and almost mm -hmm. earn the respect from the group and what what did success look like back then are you trying to win university um bucks or are you trying to get a certain time or are there are you are you looking at your peers globally on their times what are you really aiming for Matt, I was I was a na naive eighteen year old at the time. I wanted to join that training group and be the best <laughs> straight away. <laughs> I wanted to show everyone. I was like, okay, yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna show you guys what I've got. I'll, I'll be honest, that was my mindset. And if if the guys in that hear that, they won't be they won't seem surprised. Obviously, like looking back now, that's a completely unrealistic thing because these guys are levels above at that time. But it was actually a difficult. A difficult situation so i obviously came off at a i joined after just recovering from my first stress, stress fracture which was in my tibia Ooh. and then within how would i say two months i fractured my sacrum and that put me out for three months so i was out until the start the end of february and yeah and then i came back training i had march april a little bit of may and then tore my hamstring so the first year in the training group was 
was was difficult, but I think a, a lot of that came from like my eagerness to impress, to want to do everything everybody else was doing, like training mm. a higher level to almost catch up and get back to where I was before. And also with a new coach, they don't know exactly what works for you and mm. like your boundaries on what you need to be relaxed on. So we took a bit of time to get to get to that, but yeah, that's the, the card you'll do, I guess. And then, um, so from at the end of university, then what what's, what are you looking out towards as an athlete? Like, what are the the options, and and what what would most athletes in the UK think? This is my this is my absolute best set case scenario and worst case scenario. So my my university time actually finished in the middle of lockdown back in twenty twenty. So. Yeah, July, July of 2020, I handed in my, my last paper and, and yeah, it was obviously very, very strange, but that year was actually probably one of my most successful as an athlete. I won British indoors in February, just pre, pre COVID and then, um, for the 1500 and then in the September that year, I won the outdoor title as well. So it was a pretty, pretty good year for me all around and then trained as a like a professional athlete for the next year and a half until on came came along and gave gave me the opportunity of a lifetime and when when you're saying you're trained as a professional athlete so had you moved back home and you were back with the old no I, I stayed i i after well after the winning that british title i was like okay i can't we're on to something here like this is going to be going to be good and i um, sky's a limit like we don't know where where we can get to so you know i stayed stayed down in brighton for another year and just fully committed to training and yeah didn't didn't get to the level that didn't perform as i wanted to maybe that year but it was looking back it was the level that i was at and you you don't progress like it's not always going to be hmm. you know like a exponential increase in like how you perform there's going to be plateaus and and things like this and I learned that from from the last couple of years but yeah in the end of towards the end of last year we were talking about this this OAC Europe group that almost setting up and when I heard about him I, I had to do it so then from January I've been been in the team and um and before on came along like, is the aim to try and get um central funding is that typically what the... yeah probably probably that's your that's your best um best source of probably your best or, or yeah that and and your sponsorships like if you if you have sponsorships i was lucky that um like my my parents would help me out a bit if i i needed to like that they're very supportive supportive of what i do and always they always come to my races and will follow me around the world if they can for the competition so I feel very fortunate in in that sense but yes yeah, it's, it's a I think very much for athletes you'd like to you need to get your your sponsor and then yeah funding from the federation or governing body as such and what was the offer I, the table, I've then? never really I've never been too I've never really been involved in that central funding thing as of yet so I can't I can't speak too much too much on that because I don't have all of the all of the knowledge unfortunately. So when so when you first found out about on, what what did you actually read? What what were they saying was the opportunity? So they were they were when we spoke about you, they were saying they want to create a team like the OAC in the US. They want to mimic this and create a European a European version and um, we'll spend time in Probably most of the winter will spend in Dolstrom, South Africa, which are on high altitude training camps. And then in the summer, we'll spend it in Samarit. And looking at looking at this as a as a twenty two year old at the time, living on my own in Brighton, I was like, man, this is. As soon as I read it, I was like, this is a cool experience. I need to explore what what the project's going to be like, who's going to be in the team, who the coach is, 
and I just needed to ask all of the all of the questions in terms of performance and then and then make the decision but when I when I first read it, I think my emotions were was like yeah, this is a this could be a very very cool and an interesting opportunity so just to be clear what, what on how, the... how exactly that happens is that do they do they approach you is it something that you kind of have to apply for how how does it kind of yes yeah, so um and... so I think so on on had reached out to my my agent yeah um and then like spoke to him obviously I, I don't know what the, the exact conversations that they had but he was like oh would would George be interested in this and blah blah blah, blah sort of thing and then him and my dad who's involved in stuff like this with me as well because I've he's helped me along the way a lot and I value his advice and and support in every way so yeah they came to me and spoke to me saying oh there's this opportunity that on might be creating a a European team and and to be honest at that time I didn't I didn't know too much about about on they were I think they've really exploded in the last six months in terms of a brand and when when they did approach it I was like okay yeah let me let me try the shoes out let me see what's going on let me speak to the speak to various people and, and things like this and you mentioned an agent at what point did you get an agent so so in in track and field athletics you you i'd say you need you need an agent to get into race for races so that's like the most most essential thing so to get to say i this year i've raced in where have i raced i've raced uh geneva marseille um regensburg in germany Nancy, Sotville, yeah, loads of loads of different places around around Europe, and you kind of need you need an agent because they're in they're in the circle to find out when the race is going on, what the pace, what how what the quality of these races, and then they need they need to be able to have the conversations with the meet organisers to get you in to the races. So it's a it's not really something you can can do as an athlete. I mean, you probably can once you get to a certain level, but when you're a young up and comer as such, like mm. trying to make your way in the sport, then it's I'd say it's pretty important. And I've I've been with him since twenty twenty. How does that how does that relationship come about? Is that do you have to do you identify agents and then kind of pitch yourself to them or, or yeah, how does that work? Um so I, it, yes, it's kind of like they might be interested a little bit in you. You obviously need an agent at the time. They say, "Oh, we can help you with these." Like, we they'll kind of kind of reach out to you, you because they've heard it. Yeah, like they're like, "We we can we can help you get into these races." We have these athletes in our stable at the moment, and as like a younger athlete, you can kind of piggyback off the higher performing athletes in in their stable where they might put a. They might put one of their big hitters in a race and be like, mm. okay, yeah, you can have this big hitter for the meet organizer, but put this young guy in as well. Right. And and what are, what are these, how did, because everyone knows the Diamond League where mm. there's prize money on offer, there's huge television yeah. rights. But low those level, like what what are the other, how how do the other races work? Is prize money off, so on it's, offer? It's, it's called, um, it's called, it's the Continental Four. Is the net is the level below, and they have gold, silver, and bronze meetings, hmm. and they're they're usually usually pretty good quality meets. Like I've raced a couple of bronzes this year, a couple of silvers, and you can usually get a pretty good race. And they're organised very professionally. Like they've got good paces, sometimes two paces in a fifteen hundred. The European meets are great as well, especially in France and. Places like this, they get sellout crowds most of the time, but on really good events, and wow. it's, a, it's, a, it's a cracking atmosphere. They're like full of sponsors, and and yeah, it's, it's cool. The, the we... European circuit's a, a very interesting place, and I don't think too many people know much about it. But do do we have anything like that in the UK? Any any meets that are equivalent? Oh, the best meet. I, I mean, obviously, the UK you've got the Diamond League, but the best, which are awesome as. Of, of, like amazing events, it's the, the level of competition that every athlete wants to mm. compete at. But 
man, I, I always say, I say high game was the best race I've ever done <laughs> in terms of atmosphere, the buzz that I was feeling, obviously the result wasn't what I wanted, like, but if, yeah, I would, I'm, if they have a mile, I'll be there every year. I'm pretty <laughs> sure. It was, it was a special, a special, special event. I, have you guys, have you guys been? I, only quite a few years ago, I was away with, um, yeah. because of my stag do actually this time, but <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think it was the first year and it, it's, I mean, even back then you could feel the energy and yeah. it's, it's the immediacy as well. Well, especially, especially now on sponsor the meet. So oh, yeah, on of the, course. on of the main sponsor of the meet. So there it was really, obviously there was like on signs everywhere. This was my mm. first race as an official member of the oac europe it was i think it was 12 days after we'd done the launch so yeah there was a lot of excitement and and passion going on and i think that showed in how i how i raced i got a little bit overexcited but yeah it happens sometimes you've got to <laughs> got to go with it sometimes i think and and with when you're going to these these meets is the intention to um just be able to race against competitive people to improve are you trying to get um hit target times to then qualify for funding for gb are you is there prize money is there money to appear like what what is what are the real drivers for for doing these races yeah so the i'd say the main uh, the, uh, depending on the time of year it's mostly you're trying to run you're racing to try to run the quali qualifying times for Olympic world champs, European Commonwealth Games, whatever, and I don't. But then also beat beat the other guys who you're going to potentially be going up against mm. in these for the selection in these competitions. But yeah, every every race has a with with, with Thomas it's really good. Every race has like a specific target and and goal of what of what we want to achieve. But yeah, I think say ninety percent of the time in the races in May and June you're hoping for a strong field where people want to run fast so you can hit qualifying times and, and put yourself out there. And you, you mentioned quite a few of them are sold out. For the people attending, like what, what would you say the big draw for them is? Is it just that they love athletics? Is there a home favourite? Are they promised certain individuals or certain times? Or Yeah, so I think, I think back to a race I did in the Netherlands in Hengler. That was sold out. It's not. They're never in massive stadiums. There maybe, uh, maybe, oh, I don't know, a couple of thousand, few thousand people maybe, hmm. but pretty maximum. But that's still still pretty good for like a low key athletics meet, just an evening of athletics. But I think back to a meet in Hengelo, that was a gold continental for me, and they obviously had them for ball and athletes from the nation who everybody loves so yeah i think there's getting those stars in there as well but they also put on a lot of other things like the schedule is usually pretty quick and there's always extra things going on like there's food huts and so music and stuff going on in between mm. things and yeah they use they really really like hype up their their local athletes like in the french meets too i raced in Monty about a month ago and there was a couple of French guys who were local to that region who got a huge cheer when their names were names were called out. So it's, I think it's just I think it's probably they get they get locals in, they get other good people from different competitions from different nations. I mean, and then just put on a good meet of athletics. And and do you get a sense that because for most most listeners we know of our runners either from national cross countries or from mm -hmm. the world champs, the Commonwealth, the Olympics, you know, yeah. the really big events. Do you get the sense that for most European runners, by the time they've reached that level, they've all gone through these circuit circuits. Are, are you are you running into people? One hundred percent, yeah. Yeah, so I was I've been a I was probably my first race was on the circuit was probably back end of twenty twenty after um after COVID, once everything opened up, and then last year was my first first full year on it, and this year with being the second year on it, 
and it's yeah, it's, you see you see a lot of the same faces. It's probably I'd probably say it's similar to the the tennis style tours, hmm. where you have like the lower level quality le- lower level competition to qualify for the the majors or the ATP tour, ATP tour and stuff. And and are you already getting a sense then? Do you are you looking around at seeing who are your peers? Like, is there that pressure of thinking how old the people you're racing are and getting a sense of their progression for for the realizing how likely you are to then upgrade to that next level? Um, yeah, so, sometimes you look at you always look how how your competitors are doing and like what meets they're in and how they're looking but I think in athletics it's a sport obviously it's completely individual in performance where it's just you on the track and you you race to see how you go so I think everybody's trajectories and improvement happen at completely different completely different rates so it's always difficult to, to compare yourself to how other people are doing or how other people have mm. have progressed but I think with with me, I think for me, it's just really important to be to be able to perform at a consistent level and just slowly, slowly, slowly and improve because I think that's the best the best way for me to do it that me and Thomas and have spoken about. And with um, when you go to the the big um, competitions, it is a competition where sometimes mm. they run slow, sometimes they run fast. You get the surges. Do you get to well, practice? So most most of, most of these meets have paces. Ah, okay. So there's a there's an option of um, obviously if you want to be the guy, you can jump on the back of the pacer and hmm. and see what happens. That's that's been me most of the time this season, just because of the the scenarios I've I've been in. But yeah, that's you can you can choose to run a bit slower and try to run tactically and practice things if you're in a position to do that, but. When you need a time, most of the time, just get on the back of the pacer and mm. and send it as hard as you can for as long as you can. So actually, even for you, even a, like a third place might be a really good result versus winning a race yeah. that's slightly yeah, yeah, slower. Yeah. yeah, so it's it's something I've it's something I've had to learn coming into the coming into the European circuit and racing better athletes and at a higher level competition. Like you're not. As much as you may want to, you're not going to win every race, especially if you step up onto the Diamond League circuit where you've got guys who are world champions mm. and, and whatever. But yeah, I think I've, I'm pretty happy with how this year has gone. I've managed to be competing in most of the the races on the on the lower level European circuit with top three, top two, win it a couple of wins. But yeah. If you came fifth, for example, and ran a crazy time, you'd probably be like, "Yeah, okay, I'll I'll take that today." And and so how it depends, you... it depends what your goals are for the for the for the race, I guess. And how have you found um, you and the group? Really, you've mentioned how you've you've moved quite a few times. You're all quite different ages. You're all different national nationalities. Um, has have there been some difficulties with trying to adjust and? Is, are there any kind of unique um, problems thrown up that you wouldn't necessarily have if you were all training at home? Um, no, I think I think we're I, th- I think everything's been very very smooth. I obviously, in, from my experience, I don't know about the others. Maybe they feel slightly different, but I think everybody would be on the same page that they've really enjoyed the experience so far and feel like they've got a lot. A lot out of it but i think we're in a very lucky position that on are really backing us and really supporting the team and really cater to to all of our needs to make this a, a, a really professional thing is there and is there anything to, i mean is there anything that's kind of come up that you didn't expect from being in that in that kind of group atmosphere that group dynamic that that maybe has has changed how you approach it or or, or kind of changed your um uh, change your thoughts about how to prepare for things like is there is there anything that you kind of didn't expect from the from the the, the situation you're in um no i don't i don't think so to be honest. i think i asked a lot of i had some really long calls and conversations prior to agreeing to join because i wanted to get 
get as much information on what things would be like before and what things would be like, I mean, and how it would work and what the coach, what Thomas wants, like the, the sort of training he sees me doing and what he expects me to be able to do and, and various stuff like this. But I think I was fortunate again in a sense that I came into this professional, like completely professional environment with on from a pretty professional environment before. So I'd been almost like eased into it a little bit. I knew I knew more, I knew what to expect. And also with the, the background of my dad, dad playing football and stuff like that, I kind of was versed in what to expect and that you have to be really adaptable and and if you're not then it'll just hinder your your performance level. And what's who what's did your dad play for people? Oh yeah, so no, that's a go on here, yeah. ask that question. <laughs> yeah. No, he he played at uh, Leeds, Man City, played for England in the two thousand and two World Cup. Oh good dad who's your dad? Yeah. Oh my god, oh, no right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Brilliant. Oh, wow. That's amazing. <laughs> He was. I thought you might have. He was there in the in Zurich. I, I thought you might have might have seen him. No. I mean, I hadn't clocked him. Yeah. Um, oh. yeah. No. I, oh, that's amazing. Wow. Oh wow. Were you ever drawn to drawn towards football yourself? Or? I tried, mate. Tried. Tried for a long time, but yeah, I think as a as a runner now, it was probably better without the ball than with it. Because <laughs> he was. Um, if I recall, he was quite a hard player. Like, was he? Uh, was he a stern yeah. father? Um, so, so I think just took taught, taught discipline. I think that's where my work ethic and discipline come from. So no, that a bit time and a time and a place for various things. And yeah, I'm, yeah, very happy with how my upbringing was. Because you get uh, that's yeah. the thing, isn't it? You know, you get the you get the attitude you have, you get your competitive and everything else, and, and a lot of that you know will come from your parents and stuff like that. In a in a um, like a group with a group dynamic, like does, does yeah. everyone have a very similar attitude? Is everyone as competitive with each other, or do people have like a, a, sort of a different a different levels of attitude? Is there a, a, a kind of how how does that how does that work? Do you feel yeah, like they're different all approaches? Kind of the same? Yeah. So this is probably, I think, I think, yeah, I'm probably one of the most competitive in the in the group. I think me and Robert are probably quite Robert Park and the German guy. Me and him are very similar in the sense that we're crazy, crazy competitive, and sometimes struggle to not not show it or hide it if we need to a little bit. Yeah. Whereas the others are maybe a little bit a little bit better at that. But yeah, obviously, everybody being sports people, you're you're competitive, but Does within, that... within, I presume your guests talk like within group and in training. There's no, no, no competitive, no egos, nothing. Because I think on have been really clever in the sense that they, they're getting lots of different nations. So there's no direct competition, competitiveness. So on the guy side, we've got British, Swiss, Dutch, German, Irish, yeah. like so it's. It's really, really cool, and I think really healthy for the team and everybody in it. And and do you get a sense of because not everyone's going to be as successful as as others. Some of you would do really well. You know, there's going to be that spread. Do you get a sense of at what point things are going to start to deviate? Difficult question. Um, difficult question. I I don't I don't know. It's it's I think. Honor a very, very, very supportive brand, and like it feels like once you join the company, it feels like you're part of the family, almost, and that they really, really want to look after you, and they do really look after us and support us in every way that they can. But yeah, I, I, I don't know the answer to that question. Obviously, it's a, a performance-based sport, and we need to reach, reach certain levels. So I guess. I guess only the future can tell with that one. I can't say I can't say that now because I I don't know. But yeah, we'll we'll see. I guess. And coming kind of, kind of into the group that... when you were when you were kind of being pitched, you know, joining the group and everything like that, and and when you were doing your research as to kind of what you'd be doing from an athletics perspective, like the big thing that on we're talking about is actually you know really showcasing the athletes and getting people to fall in love with the athletes and the stories and and everything you're doing. Yeah. Like how much 
did they say that they you know need you to commit to um you know you know being available for for like social media being available you know for for anything in terms of like helping promote yourself or anything else like that how 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 did yeah. that kind of go from a, like when they're initially negotiating with you perspective in terms in terms of what they what they they ask you to do so yeah they were they were always there was obviously talks about about that and how they wanted to market market the team and build the team as a brand and something that people can really get behind but they very much wanted to be from what i understood and how i understand that they want it to be natural yeah they don't want if somebody's not a an outgoing person doesn't want to do things crazy i think there's obviously certain things that we all have to do certain events that we all have to be at for the marketing of the, the company but in terms of the little things they want to show everybody's personality and obviously everybody's everybody's different we've all had completely different journeys backgrounds upbringings and we all like, everybody speaks different languages as well like i think that's a really a really interesting thing as well but yeah the marketing the marketing side of it they're very much natural with it and want to show the people that we are rather than force us to pretend to be something and and what's the reality of that not. at the moment then? Is that uh, you know when you're when you're doing training and stuff, are there, are there like cameras there and people following you around, or you know what 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 does that kind of look like when they are like in a practical level of trying to trying to build build you up as a brand and showcase your stories? Yeah, so we've we've done done little bits. There's some they've done some stuff with the US team called Table Talk, which is on YouTube, which is a really cool concept. It's just like short two to five minute clips I think of each athlete on the massage bed like just talking about their story and their and their background and yeah they also come come in time in uh, come in sometimes with the team and we talk about other stuff and yeah it's, it's just it's just very relaxed in terms of it there's obviously complete direction with the the marketing side of stuff and what they want to do but everything's very a very natural process and not forced in any way at all like if you don't want to if you don't want to do something you don't feel completely comfortable then i think i think that's okay obviously you can probably guess that i love doing that sort of thing more than <laughs> more than happy with with the camera stuck in my face but yeah, other people, other people might be different. They're not. They're not trying. And, to, they're not you, trying to create a bit of drama and a bit of tension because every, everyone needs a little bit of tension to make those things, those things, yeah, you know, really kind of pop on social media. I think like. we, we can, we can, we can do it. We can do it ourselves. I think we can have a bit of banter on on social media with the team with a comment on somebody's Instagram, maybe, and and various stuff like this. Maybe some some little clips come out as us giving each other a bit of banter in training. So. Yeah, it's all it's all very healthy and good fun. And then, um, because what what I think would be really that the hard part is is when someone does leave, and mm. if they go to if it does feel like a family, if you're training in Leeds, Harrogate, or or some, or um, Brighton, then when someone's not performing well, they're there with you, not performing well. Whereas with this group suddenly it could almost be like you've had a death in the family because suddenly so-and-so has gone to, but not even that, when someone goes to another brand or if someone yeah. you know, just gets cut. like have... so I think, yeah, I think, um, I think, I don't know. Yeah, obviously if anybody, if that did happen down the line, and I think, I think it, it will, like we're in a professional sport. I don't think there's any denying that we're all going to be, be here forever we all have a contract at the moment that expires at a certain date everybody's everybody might be different i don't i don't know the ins and outs of it but i think we're all mature enough and completely understand that this is professional sport and it's not it's not this is it's not a it doesn't go on forever so have you it's not have you not discussed with your fellow teammates then your contracts then you're not like come on how much you want how long you want how long you got <laughs> uh, we're not not all the details we have we, we maybe have a little bit of a chat sometimes about it but yeah it's not it's not something we really really talk about too much to be honest yeah but, i mean i can yeah. I, 
I can understand why, because you, you don't want to find out. Um, well, in, in some ways, it's, it's British sensibilities. You don't want to ever talk about anything that um, is that personal. But um, do you get a sense that people are on fairly similar contracts? Or I think so. I think so. Yeah, and it's more about it's more about the whole package with on rather than just the numbers, whatever, and things like this. Like they. They want you to help. They want us to help develop kit, develop shoes, be part of a professional team based in Europe, which is unheard of. I don't think there's another athletics, a professional athletics team in Europe like like us. Like in the US, it's a lot more common. There's hmm. hundreds maybe, but this is probably the first of its kind in Europe. So putting that completely aside, it's, a, it's an awesome project to be a part of. And do you think, because um, I was going to say, do you think it's working? But there's obviously two sides to that. There's the, the marketing side, and then there's the, the performance side. And from the marketing side, do you get a sense that, like, and who were we talking with, J.D., where we, they were, we were talking about um, whether people are going to buy into teams and start following a team rather than following a brand or following an individual? Yeah, yeah. Uh, do, do you get the sense... Because it was quite recent, wasn't it? Do you, do you get the sense that people are starting to yeah. kind of... And, and what does that look like? like what, how, how are you... What do you think is drawing people into want to follow an ONAC um, rather than well, on think, or rather than individual? Or I think it's always easier to get behind the team than an individual. First of all, if you look at various other sports, it's always easier to get behind a group and follow a group rather than just one one person and i think with the with the stuff we show on social media the characters we have the stuff that we'll be doing in the future with on in terms of marketing and showing what happens behind behind the scenes i think it's something that people really will will get behind and like like to follow because we've got we've got some really cool characters in the team and they're yeah, people haven't probably seen everything or any of that yet. So, mm. yeah, I think once that happens, it'll just grow and grow. I think there's a really, a really high ceiling for this sort of thing. And and the and, and good marketing pigeonholes mm. it it, uh, it gives people a simple. But we can we can also obviously obviously results is the most important thing. Results if we're all performing well, people will start to follow us more. So, as athletes, that's the main thing that we we need to focus on and be geared to but yeah we've got we're posting cool cool pics on instagram giving a little little insights into our track workouts and and bits like this then i think it's it can always grow a little bit and obviously like getting a word out on on podcasts and stuff like yours is only only healthy i think do you, do you get the sense that they've they've cre- they've chosen a, a mix of personality types as well from a marketing perspective because if you look at things like the Spice Girls, for example, you've got your posh, mm. you've got your scary, you've got your sporty. Do you do you think they've actually thought about the dynamic of the group and thought actually it would be good to try and appeal to all these different personality types? Yeah, 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 of course. And I think I think that's part of building a healthy team and a healthy team culture. Anyway, I don't think you can have if you have all of the same person, then it will probably not end well because they'll all clash or won't get along so everybody has different skills to complement each other and complement the team and everybody has something completely different to offer which is really cool really cool and really interesting to see i was going to ask you who's the howard but i don't think you'd know who i meant who the howard was the howard yeah i was i'd have to google it quickly yeah 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 i was like he's he's the backing dancer from it he's he's the best he's the yeah, all my references are from about twenty years ago. So, just... <laughs> and, what, um, what does it mean? Say again. Out of interest. What does it mean? Out of interest. He was the shit. Oh, so the Howard the was... would take that. Howard... Wasn't he? <laughs> oh, if we're going to put it that way, he was the least. The kind least of the backing one. dancer one is. He's there just to be like for numbers, maybe to appeal to the older ladies or <laughs> no, no comment. <laughs> Enthusiasm about talent, and um... I, I probably I, I don't know. So if if you don't know, maybe it's me then. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. And and is it, is you... it one of those? If, if if you're not sure, then it's like oh, actually. That's <laughs> 
Well, you no, could I think be, it'd be good. I think you're good. You could be the Robbie. I don't know whether they, they want to like pitch you as the Robbie because you know that's the that's the that's the one to be out of take. That isn't it? You're either Robbie or Gary. <laughs> yeah, you'd probably you'd probably take either, wouldn't you? Yeah. To be honest, yeah, you'd definitely. Just be half as successful as them, and you're probably doing all right. And and do you get a sense from you know you've you've trained in with your group in Southampton and you've trained mm. with uh, this slightly different system. Do you, do you think there are kind of notable notable differences in in the way athletes engage in their training when they are in a, a kind of a team brought together for on versus? Yeah, so I th- it's, yeah, I think I think so. Like we all we're all incredibly so we we do genuinely feel like a team, which is quite strange for an individual sport where it's like only you on the start line, but when when I see the other guys, if I'm not at a race and I see the other guys be successful, like it genuinely gives me joy and happiness and I feel proud of like the team. Like it's so it's it's actually it's like a really nice nice thing to be a part of because I think in track and field that's not hmm. not something that many people get to experience. Yeah, you probably only get it at the, the junior as well, when you, the club level, like um or yeah. at the, the G B level. So there yeah. isn't that but even even then at GB the team's so big you're not having mm. personal relationships with with everyone like for us there's five five guys at the moment and and three girls so there's eight of us so we're all very like very close have very like close relationships with each other we know know everybody really well we spent a lot of time time together so when somebody performs well like we are really happy about it. and also in, the, in turn obviously you go and not have good races sometimes we're there for them when we're like mm. okay yeah we know this we know this happens get your head back up get back to work and you'll come again keep working and and when you look ahead to you know, gb team 1500 meters 100 3000 5000 really competitive right now like actually the level of talent is Mm-hmm. It's it's been a bit lost for a few years, but it does seem now you're like wow, this is this is really pushing the, the, being the best in the world. Um, like how yeah. does that? Do you look at that and th- does that excite you? Um, knowing that you're you, that is what's surrounding you, or is that frustrating because you're thinking, Christ, how do I break into this? No, I think I think it's incredibly exciting. To be honest, I think it's it pushes you in a way and makes you do things that you probably wouldn't like in terms of pushing yourself in training and recovering right and doing every little thing like you can like what do they the all the all the little marginal gains like stretching on a night getting to bed early eating right doing every little thing in training that you can i think you know that you have to you almost have to be perfect to be able to make a team, you have to be firing on all cylinders and be be one of the best in the world to try and make a, a GB team, which I think is only only a healthy thing and only makes you become a better athlete. And in terms of um, for people who want to get better at have fifteen hundreds, eight hundreds, like <laughs> what what would you say are the, the keys to the the biggest wins for someone who's a kind of an amateur runner? So what what sort of level are you in? We talking just like um, amateur club level or yeah, like... kind of amateur club level. Yeah, we've just had one of the one of the main questions. What well, the main questions coming in actually because we've never really talked about training at yeah. um, for shorter distances. Yeah, so I think yeah, it's, it's as a middle distance runner, you have to cover every base. Like you have to do the fast work, you have to do the the high volume work. So. The training that we do is the training that I've started doing since January with Thomas is really interesting and I really believe that it's the right the right way for me to train. So we do everything is very controlled. We measure the lactate and stuff. I don't know if you've spoken about stuff like that before. To like make sure that we're hitting the right zones, we're training the right zones and everything that we're doing has a reason. So whether that's like a VO2 max session threshold session or a, a speed work session or like a, an easy run but 
yeah, our week our week involves pretty much everything. With with the main focus being on uh, a Tuesday and a Saturday, where we'll do a VO two max session in the morning, threshold session in the evening, and then the same on Saturday. Oh wow! So you do both two session two hard sessions actually the same day. Yeah. So actually, I had that's what I I had today. So I was I was saying I was like, yeah, I've got a got a double session day. So yeah, this morning we had some some hard 300 reps on the track off so track off short recovery and then this evening we had a three by 10 minute threshold and thresholds like mar- probably probably marathon marathon pace and what's um do you know what the theory do you know what the theory of, of grouping them together is what why because i think most people would typically probably chuck one on the thursday yeah, yeah so in in england in England, Britain, it's, that's classic. That's what I've done my whole career. But mm. I think it's more of a a European style to do them on on the boat, both the days where it almost teaches the body to recover a bit faster. And obviously, being professionals, we have the time to train in the morning, come home, sleep, mm. recover, and then and then go out again. And I think it just allows you to get a greater volume of training in. Because mm. even like three times ten minutes marathon pace. That's quite. That's a pretty tough session on its own. Yeah, well, up at up at up eighteen hundred meters as well. So it's it it feels good, but you just you you control it to the right zone. Everything's done off like your heart. Well, we we obviously when we're running, we're looking at our heart rate, and then we measure our black pay after just to, just as an extra marker to check we're in the right zone. And so you you so, didn't so, kind of is that through blood right. this time then? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just like the prick and then the little, the little machine. Took me a while to get to get used to controlling and learning my zones, but I think I think we're getting there now. <laughs> Every, and, everything uh, was full full throttle for a while. <laughs> and uh, do you because we um, we spoke to John Alban, who's uh, just just won uh, one of the Golden Trail races, and he was saying okay. about how. He his training methodology has, has changed mainly in, in the last couple of years away from eighty twenty running and realizing actually that he for him he's doing less than eighty he's like reducing that down and doing more faster runs as okay. as, as a percentage like would you say that are you still in the kind of eighty twenty thinking or do you think that your training is is now edging towards more harder marks so it's every day every day is different every day has a like today we've had had a really high volume and high intensity day so then tomorrow we'll run easy run control and so every i think as a middle distance runner not every day is the the same and it's difficult to be so widespread in that and it's just selecting like okay today this is the goal of training this is the goal of training tomorrow and except and and those those things are but in overall i'd say i'd say the training is very controlled like we don't we don't push completely we push the limit very very rarely it's more mm. about staying maybe just under that level so that you can get the continuity of training and, and the consistency in there like I don't I don't mind saying like I I can sometimes get up to 160 Ks a week because we were able to control the training and manage the load in terms of intensity and duration and everything like this. And um and just to uh, I guess a nice one to come to the end like what what is your big goal for the next year would you say like what would success look like? Uh, oh I want to make the world champs team next year. The outdoor, yeah. That's that's the main goal. That's what I will be focused on. I by no means say that lightly. I know how how hard that will will be to make, and I'm sure there is five, six, seven, eight other guys with exactly the same goal. So you've got you've got to earn it, and you've got to put in the work. But that is that's the focus of mine for the next for the next year. And what would you put your percentage chance at? For uh, hitting that target, I wouldn't say a percentage, but I think you, being a sportsman, you have to you have to back yourself. Obviously, now looking at from from the outside and 
from somebody else's perspective, you'd probably say, yeah, okay, George, he's run slower than maybe five or six other guys, so he's got less of a chance than them. But yeah, I I believe if I if I do the work and put myself in the right places and do the right things, then there's there's a chance. But at the end of the day, you have to perform at exactly the right time to be able to take that opportunity. So yeah, I can't I can't say it say a percentage but I'll, I'll be doing everything I can to try and make that opportunity a reality amazing well absolutely all the best of luck with that and um I mean I from a personal point of view I, I really like the fact that I've done this and um I think it's good for the sport and the individuals involved so um but thank you so much for coming on the podcast and uh, best of luck with qualifying for those world championships do my best, man. Thank you very much for having me on. It's a pleasure to see you guys again. Cheers, George. All the best. Fuck you, buddy. <laughs>